Welcome back. Oh, you've sprung up next to me again. You're making a habit of this. I know we're mates, but I don't want you too close. Welcome back. Our next guest is very topical with an election just around the corner. This man is a former long-serving member of Parliament who knows all the ins and outs of policy platforms and the ballot box. And fortunately for us all, we're not going to talk to him about any of that because it's boring. And we'd much rather talk about his 332 games of AFL football and two premierships with Carlton. Thanks for joining us, Justin Madden. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, no uh, no political type answers, but I will ask you one, just to kick us off. You served in the ALP, ALP Brax and Brumby governments. Surely that was a reaction to years and years of putting up with that lovable old fascist president of yours, John Elliott. <laughs> well, look, I can't comment on that. But what I can say, if there was ever proof that I received uh, significant brain trauma, my footballing colleagues say it was proved by the fact that I went into politics. And that's probably not a bad <laughs> assessment in many ways. <laughs> Do you get to the football much these days, Justin? Uh, what probably, you the probably more recently. I've been to a few games this year. Uh, our kids, you know, are driving the sport all weekend, so I haven't had much of a chance over recent years to get to a lot of games. But uh, the few games I've seen this year, they've been very good. I follow them very closely on the on the telly. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they're OK. They're yeah. looking all right. But I, I just don't want people to get too excited too soon. You know, I'm a great believer in the understatement. You don't want to get ahead of yourself. So maybe they've got people too excited too early. Maybe it's a comment on the side of the played too. But I'm not saying they're, yeah. they're not a good team, but maybe some of the teams they've played aren't that flash. Yeah. So you're saying after the Collingwood win when they got the three peak T-shirts made, <laughs> <laughs> and now they've got the four in a row. <laughs> it's a bit, yeah, well, you've got to market as quickly as you can these yeah. days, can't you? But uh, people are pretty excited, and I think... I think predominantly they're just playing a better brand of football. I think some of those rule changes uh, this year have helped Carlton to an extent, and many of the other teams that have adopted a more um, a, 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 or a less defensive game and a, and a more um, uh, play to play to the centre and play on top game rather than play defensive to the wing. And, and I, for years, I've been, like many other Carlton supporters, I've been tearing my hair out when teams spend too much time going to the boundary. So you're talking about the number of scores in a game and, and those things. There are about 50 shots in a game. And if you're not scoring something every two minutes mm. by taking three minutes to get to your goals, even if you can goal, you're doing the job of the defenders yeah. for the other team. And uh, Carlton have done pretty well at that over recent years, but they've improved their game this year. What about, I, I feel like they've improved as a whole club too. It's like that, you know, it's taken a long time for that mentality that it's not the old days anymore to sink in, I think. And, and they've looked for saviours and they've looked for quick fixes. Finally, now it looks like, you know, they've put their faith in a, a teaching coach. They've put their faith in redeveloping the list. They're a bit more low-key about about how things are, are put together off the field as well as on it. Do you get that impression? Well, I, I think they, they tried a whole lot of things and none of them seemed to work. And they finally came back to the realisation that they needed a significant shift in their club culture. Um, and the best clubs who perform well consistently have good culture, it, like any organisation. So they've put a bit of faith in people around culture, not necessarily you know, on-field form immediately. And if you have good people, you eventually get good form. And I think that's, that's showing this year. Is there, is there a, an argument for the fact that Carlton and Essendon, who, who happen to share the record for most premierships, had rested on their laurels and been very confident and believed in their methods ultimately succeeding. For Carlton it was their ability to pull out the star recruit, to go to the checkbook and, and get their messiah. Judd was the last of them and for Essendon it was very much, Essendon people will win through in the end, we'll go to our own. So one club ignored the draft and ignored the salary cap and that was Carlton and the other club Essendon went back to James Hurd when he had two years away from football. And both of them, both of them paid the price for hubris. I, I, I feel. Oh, look! I think there's a bit of that, but I also think that you know, when times are tough, you got to you got to make your members happy. And often, you know, a messiah might help bring in the memberships and the the marketing. But that only lasts for so long. And I think I think uh, both clubs have been found out. But and, I think and I believe in the messiah analogy, Mick Moldhouse is not the Messiah, he's just a naughty boy. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for some of yeah, that one. Release but it, but the, <laughs> the, other, the other component I think too that the uh, expansion teams 
and I don't think there's been a lot of discussion around this, but the expansion teams have really come at the cost of the more established teams. Mm. So that particularly the drafts in recent years, uh, particularly if you haven't travelled well, Carlton and Essendon haven't travelled that well, but there, there's probably a handful of clubs who are now suffering, the more established clubs who are suffering because the expansion clubs got the best of the crop and then they had to get the second best for a period of time and that hasn't helped them. And so uh, whilst the expansion clubs have got what they need, some of these, uh, some of the more established clubs are suffering and still suffering. Now, I want to ask you specifically about ruck work. You're one of the, the great ruckmen. I, I get the impression um, the ruck is having a bit of a resurgence. I think there's been periods over the last few years when people have questioned just how relevant it is and doesn't matter who wins the hitouts, but hitouts to advantage seems to be a, a, a more key stat now. We've seen Todd Goldstein play some fantastic football. Nick Natanui's a really exciting guy who sort of could revolutionise the way that the Rucks played out. Max Gorn's a big improver, we're all talking about him. You obviously watch the Ruck pretty closely. How do you find it now compared to, say, when you played? Uh, well, We've got some footage of yeah, you too here which will roll out. It can't out be good. It, it can't, it it can't at all be good. But uh, uh, look, I think uh, it's often underestimated in terms of your tactics. Thanks very much for the coverage. <laughs> that's that as fast Who as I was ever driving got. that car? Some good that's highlights. Good, here. good question. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't pretty, and I wouldn't even say it was effective, but oh, it was there. there. It was one of the great. Now, was this was this the highlight of your career? It was one of the highlights, and it's great to know that you're remembered for something completely uncharacteristic <laughs> of your entire career. Um, but I, I think most importantly. Um, uh, the good ruckmen prove up their case, mm. and we've had some really good ruckmen in recent years who've proved up their relevance and their, the, you know, the, the 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 contribution to the team's operation mm. and the strategy. If if your ruckmen are just there to fill a space, and some of them uh, have been in recent times because they haven't, some of the clubs haven't recruited well. They've tried to recruit an athlete, not a ruckman. Yeah. Most ruckmen are not athletes. If you get one that has a bit of athleticism, even better. But you've got to go for a ruckman first and foremost, rather than an athlete. And a lot, interesting enough, a lot of the kids that come through these days that are six foot six, six foot seven, they're so athletic mm -hmm. uh, as young players. They don't play them in the rucks at their local clubs. And I've seen it a lot of the local uh, suburban clubs. They play them at centre forward because they're athletes. Mm -hmm. So when they get to an older age and somebody says, "Well, you need to play in the ruck," some of these poor kids have got no idea. So there's there's a there's a fair degree of effort you've got to put into a, a young, tall ruckman to develop them, and you've got to give them a bit of time for, the, for their maturity. And the draft system in recent years hasn't afforded that luxury, and not having a second as it used to be the case, you could get a Roger Merritt and spend five years turning him into a fantastic player. They don't have time to do that anymore, and I think the ruck, rucks have suffered for that. How good was that 95 team? We only lost two games. Compared yeah. to, you know, everyone always talks about the great Lions teams and, and Hawthorne in recent times. I know you just won the one flag, but how good was that side? Well, I think we're a good team because we we're just a, a really solid bunch of yeah. players and we had the right mix, and, and like any premiership player. Um, we probably should have done a lot better. We probably should have won a couple of other grand finals, but, you know, that's, that's an opportunity lost. Yeah. But it, what it does prove, if you've got good people and a good culture, success follows, and I think that's what we had. And I think that was the thing that Carlton took a while to learn and they're starting to build that now. Interesting contrast between the two flags you played in too because 87, I think even Carlton people acknowledge that wasn't one of the great Carlton teams in terms of uh, individual ability and yet you had it over Hawthorne that year and, and beat them comfortably when it mattered. We did. We had a good run into the finals. I think Hawthorne played um, in a second semi out at Waverley and it was... Uh, uh, it might have been preliminary final, but they played in really hot weather. The Jimmy Steins. That's, right, the, Buckner, that's right, yep. the Jimmy Steins. Oh, kicked against the wind for three right. quarters. Yeah. Played a big game, hot weather, big ground, close tuff, <coughs> tussle, which was very handy going into the grand final for us yeah. in that year because we played on a 30 degree day, mm. and so they were exhausted by about quarter time. Even Michael Tuck had the short sleeve jump on, which was, I, was think, I think that was, that statement lost on the whole game, that one. I don't know, what, what's the scarier look, Michael Tuck in short sleeves or you wearing a helmet? Uh, absolutely, well, yeah, I, my <laughs> helmet would scare nobody, it, but Michael Tuck's arms were pretty pale, <laughs> but I think my helmet was, uh, yeah, not to be forgotten. You got a couple of weeks from that game, didn't you? Just, uh, no, I just wore it once, just but like, it lives in yeah. perpetuity, for sure, <laughs> the memory. Did you give someone a whack, though, in the 87 grand final? Michael Tuck. Tuck, yeah, that's yeah. right. Oh, did you? Yeah. So you told him you off for wearing that short sleeve. I'd never meant to hurt anybody <laughs> at all, and when I did, I always said sorry. <laughs> in any game. So. Yeah. I'm sure that made him feel better after they lost yeah. the grand final. That's right, yeah, exactly. Harry, exactly. You're, you're a patron of 
of the um, AFL Fans Association. And yes. I think for, for some people it's a bit of a toothless tiger, but I reckon it's got a, a very important role to play. Actually, had is it Gary or Jerry Eamon? The yeah, that's right. The yeah, president. Yeah, it's, it's Jerry Eamon. And yeah. uh, uh, I'm the patron. They yeah. approached me and asked me would I become the patron. I was very keen to because I think... Um, uh, and this probably goes back to my politics, you know, uh, associations and also a, a collective, the collective can all often achieve and more often achieve uh, better results than individuals. And I think that if uh, the fans are going to get a better deal, they need to sort of approach things collectively. And I think yep. the, the Fans Association have a great chance to do that. And uh, particularly around some of the more technical issues that uh, the AFL, the Players Association, the broadcasters will have to grapple with in years to come. And uh, whether stadiums are like they are in America, small stadiums for only a few few people uh, and selective, or you've got to pay through the nose to get into those stadiums, or whether the game continues to be a game for everybody where everybody gets a chance to, to get to the game at a reasonable price. So I think they're very significant issues for the game, particularly when you put those as, uh, in contrast to broadcast rights and the revenue that that generates. I mean, Jerry actually brought up a really good point last night, and that is something that's attainable. It's frustrating when you go to a game, you pay a reasonable price for a ticket, and you look over and the best seats in the house are empty. And there's no reason why surely we can't get upgrades on the night or during the day. Well, I, th I think there's, there's a lot of chance for technology to offer that. And I know some of the best sporting stadiums in the world and some of the, the sports codes that, and clubs that are on top of their game are now offering the chance for people to upgrade on their phone once you get near the stadium. Uh, I'm sure that will eventuate, but you've also got to have the mindset for that and you've got to be focused on it. I'm sure the AFL, in their wisdom, will become focused on that in years to come. Now, I, it, it's good to see you, patron of the association, but I, I'm hoping this will play out in practical terms. I expect to see you sitting next to Joffa with his gold coat on, the Collingwood Cheers Club. Oh, I'm happy to sit wherever they, they give me a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the collective, the collective bargaining agreement between the players and the AFL has now been broken. What would you like to see the players get out of this? Do you think they need the set percentage, which is what they've been asking for? Well, I, th I think the revenue is always important, yeah. but the revenue is not the single most important issue. The single most important issue are conditions. Yeah. And the conditions, part of those conditions are the revenues. The conditions are other things, and we've got a whole lot of issues that certainly uh, stick in a lot of players' claw at the moment, yeah. um, you know, around privacy, testing, expectations of clubs. I think they're all important issues. And then life after football and, um, you know, head trauma and uh, and how you how you find meaning in your life after a game. I think uh, after you've played the game. I think they're all important issues that the Players Association shouldn't lose sight of. And I also, I'm a great believer that the uh, draft has probably run its course. Um, it seems when the AFL get into a bit of trouble, we'll compromise the draft with expansion clubs or uh, when the when players are suspended for various reasons in large numbers, mm. uh, let's just compromise the draft. One of the key platforms for the draft in, our, in the collective bargaining agreement now, though, there were three things that were established. Basically, the salary cap, the, the draft, and the standard player contract. They were the three corners, or the three components of the collective bargaining agreement, and the Players Association have always abided by that. But in recent years, the AFL have sought to compromise the draft. The players haven't. In the NRL, they don't have a draft, and that was because the players challenged that. Mm. The players have, in the AFL have chosen never to challenge that in order to have those conditions, yeah. those extra conditions. And I think uh, if the AFL are going to compromise the draft so regularly, why have it? Then why not scrap the draft? Yeah, big believer. Yeah. Then scrap, how, would that, how would it work, say, from next year? If there's no well, you'd draft. have a salary cap, and yeah. you, you'd just purchase what you can afford. Yeah. So, so you've got... You know, you don't need you don't need two mechanisms to control it. You need one, and I reckon that's the salary cap. If the salary cap is doing what it's supposed to be doing, but you don't need both. You need one, but you don't need both. A far more important one to finish. You and Simon both very musically minded. Who's the better guitarist? Uh, well, Simon plays more regularly, so he has to be the better guitarist. Although I have seen his band on a few occasions. Yeah, I've heard they're quite uh, good. Better late than never. Mm. They often play. I think it's at the Ascot Vale Hotel on a Saturday night. Nice plug. Uh, and I, yeah, I've better get that. It, it's funny. All, all, it's a bit like a barbecue. All the girls are dancing on one side, and <laughs> all the blokes are all standing at the bar yeah, drinking. Yeah. But it seems to work well. Yeah. And. Uh, 
Uh, I, I don't go too often, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about our vintage. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. You're uh, in illustrious company. Steve McBurney we've had in, Colin Carter, but uh, you're right. the first poly we've had in. And unusually for a politician, you've actually made sense and haven't talked complete garbage. So thanks well, for thank coming you. along. Oh, some would challenge that. I talk garbage most of the time. That's what my kids tell me. And uh, can I just... It's been great to be here with... Uh, you know, faces made for radio. Thanks very much. <laughs> You're very you, kind. You scrub up pretty well next door. <laughs>